Joining me today is a New Zealand-born author, speaker, and founder and headmistress of Michaela Community School, a free school established in London all the way back in 2014. Catherine Burble Singh, welcome to the Rubin Report. Hi, hi. I am very happy to have you here. Well, thank you. Thanks have, for having me. I have heard a rumor that you sometimes play my videos in your <laughs> classrooms. Well, I don't know about the classrooms, but among staff, yeah. Among staff, in yeah. the school, somewhere in the school. <laughs> yeah, in the school, definitely. Um, we're Far all great too, fans. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Far too controversial to play in the classroom. Yeah, I think so, I think so. Uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about, about education, your, your personal sort of political evolution, all the things that you've been through. So uh, I always like finding out a little bit about somebody's history at the top, and you come from a, a long line of teachers and some interesting background stuff, so tell me a little bit about young about Catherine. Me. Well, um, I mean, my parents, my father is Indian Guyanese, my mum is Jamaican, black Jamaican. I, I say that because the whole race thing is important, yeah. you know, uh, bizarrely, because these days, you know, uh, people are so much more interested in who said it as opposed to what is being said. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, someone, some random person set up a Wikipedia page for me and there was this kind of major uh, argument going on between my detractors and, and the people who support me. People who support me wanted the truth to be there. The people who didn't like me wanted it to to, wanted me to be Indian rather than black because black was kind of a bigger victim and ah, yes, to discredit yes. me they needed to push me up the the victim pole you know yes so it can get hard following the oppression olympics you it, know it's it, a whole operation over there yeah i know exactly and so uh you know my my uh, mother was a nurse my father um taught at university and, and, and came from, you know, dirt poverty in Guyana, but is one of those extraordinary people who made something of himself through hard work. And um, I was born in New Zealand and then I grew up in Canada and then I've now been in London for, you know, nearly 30 years. And uh, I went to Oxford University and I've been a teacher ever since. And I was a very left-wing teacher, uh, very typical teacher in that way. Yeah. And I used to write a blog. Um, which was called To Miss With Love, based on the book and film Sir, To Sir With Love. You know, mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier was in the film. And um, I wrote this blog. You know, a few times a week I'd go home and write about how little Johnny had his money stolen and that kind of thing. Things that made me really upset about the education yeah. system. And uh, Wait, let's pause for a second before yeah. you get to, get to the point okay. where you sort of woke up and got okay, into trouble okay, okay, and okay, now yeah. have people fighting on your Wikipedia page. So what, what sort of education did you have that pushed you towards leftism? Or was it just, just how it was, kind of? Like, where did those ideas come from? Did that, did that come from schooling? Yeah. Did that come from family? Was it media? I suppose my family. Yeah. You know, um, it's really interesting because I think um, ethnic minorities really are small c conservative naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, but because uh, the black vote normally goes to the left, uh, my family was no different from, from a typical uh, fam, you know, uh, ethnic family in that sense. And so I was brought up in a, in a, in a left-wing household. Yeah, why um, do you think they generally vote small c conservative? Or that they're, why not they vote, not that vote. No. Why do they internally either think it or have been taught to think it? I think they come from small c conservative um, uh, Background. So when I say that, just the belief in in pulling yourself up from your own boots, with your own bootstraps, um, hard work will get you somewhere. Uh, personal responsibility, being stoical when things are difficult. Um, that's the kind of thing Those are that makes great people things. successful. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And and ethnic minorities, especially the ones who've been immigrants, moved somewhere new, they believe in giving their children a, a better life and in working hard in order to be able to do so. So. Yeah. It fits with them. Okay, yeah. so now, so you come from a small C conservative family, but kind of voting left. Yes. And then that's right. You start writing and this then, blog, and, and I'm a teacher, so everyone I know is on the left, and I don't speak to any conservative people because that's how it is. There's this big divide, and nobody ever speaks to each other. I didn't know any conservative people or the way conservative people thought, and then I was writing this blog, and that's where I started meeting conservative people, and I say meet on my blog, so Twitter didn't exist in those days. People would have discussions on the blog comment section. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these left-wingers would come on and um, start attacking me and telling me how awful I was with the stories that I was writing and how could I judge the education system as I was judging it. And uh, all these conservatives would come on and defend me. And I'd be saying to the left-wingers, no, 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 I'm one, of, well, I'm one of you, you know, I'm with you, I'm a good person. And they'd say, no, you're a right-winger. And I'd say, well, of course I'm not on the right, of course I'm not conservative, I'm a good person. <laughs> so how could I possibly be conservative? Yeah. And the conservatives would come on and say, 
I think you'll find that you are. And over years of me writing and me insisting that I was on the left, I came to realize that I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that my instincts, the things that I valued, the values, it was the, it, it, those basic values of personal responsibility and, 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 and perseverance and, and, and being happy with competition and all that kind of stuff, um, I, I, I liked. And, and then I realized, I, I came to realize slowly. And, and then I met a few people. So like I met, you would be interested because you're always interested in meeting people who don't think like you. Yeah. I met this guy, so there was this guy who used to come onto my blog called uh, he, British National uh, Party member. So he was, he was this, this, I mean, people call it the fascist party, you know, and in the day they had a lot more power than they do nowadays. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was part of the BNP and I would let him come on my blog. So all of these kind of lefties were outraged. How can you let him come on your blog? You need to ban him. But I always thought, What do you well, mean you come know. on your blog? Just, just commenting? So commenting. Just commenting. He would comment and get okay. into discussion sometimes with me and sometimes with other people. And some of the left wingers would refuse to uh, talk to him at all, you right. know, and they would get really angry with me. That you didn't for ban him That I should just say, you're not allowed to be on here. And then, you know, I, I, he was on there for ages. This is over years. And then, um, and then I said, you know, it'd be really interesting to meet you because you're very different from anybody I know. And so I met this guy and, you know, I mean, he was a, a racist, you know, I mean, he was, you know, the things that he believed about black people and so on, he was a racist, but you know, what I always say is some of my best friends are racist, you know? <laughs> it's like Avenue Q, you know, the, the musical yeah. with, you know, everyone's a little bit racist and people are racist on different levels, you know? Sometimes you're really racist, sometimes you're just a little bit racist. Anyway, I met with him. He was wearing a suit, he was a young white guy, um, wearing a suit and nice shoes and, and he went and he took me for lunch, he paid for lunch. So the racist took you for lunch? That's right, that's right. That's okay. what's so interesting about life, right? Yeah. And um, so we went for lunch and he was hobbling along and I said, you know, you were right. And he said, oh, you know, the thing is I bought this suit and, and these shoes because I was meeting with you and you know, you went to Oxford University and, and I figured, I gotta get dressed up, you know? But the, sh the shoes are new and they're really hurting my feet. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Here's this racist yeah. who was taking me for lunch, who's wearing new shoes that he's bought because <laughs> yeah. I've been to Oxford, you know? And that's what's so interesting about life is that it's not as easy as some of the left put people, you know, you're a racist, you're not a racist, you're a good person, you're a bad person, you're this. It's not like that. There's a whole variety of different ways of seeing people and learning from people. Yeah. And, um, and was he able to learn from you after that lunch? Well, we met a second time and you know, I mean, when I say he was, I mean, like he was telling me about how that morning he'd been to see his girlfriend and they have a toddler. And uh, he'd gone to see her and see the, the, the baby. She wouldn't let him hold the baby because she knew that he was coming to see me. Wow. And she said, you're going to contaminate him because wow. you're so going that, to. That, that's you know, true racism. Yeah, Maybe exactly. that's like truly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but, you know, he was a good guy in so many other ways. And that's what. That's what's interesting about life, is what I'd say, um, is that uh, nobody's perfect and people change their minds. You know, I think about my parents who lived in the same house for 46 years in Toronto and um, there was a man called Mr. Snow who lived opposite them. And when, he mo when they moved into the area, it was all white mm -hmm. and he was outraged because he was a racist and he thought, no way, I don't want these people living there. And over the years, over the 46 years, they got to know each other and they became friends. And in the end, Mr. Snow's wife, you know, she, she got cancer and she died. And Mr. Snow uh, had to depend on my parents for a whole lot of help. And, and my parents loved Mr. Snow and mm -hmm. Mr. Snow loved them. Um, you know, things can change, people can change. And when Mr. Snow died, my parents moved house because the, the, the community they lived in had, had, had died. Yeah. With, with Mr. Snow. And this was the man who was so racist, he didn't want them to live there, you know? Isn't it personally powerful too? I mean, I can feel it when you're saying it, that when you can accept some people for all their flaws, that it actually allows you to figure out how to grow instead of just mm -hmm. othering them forever, even, even if they might do that to a whole set of people for awful reasons. Yeah, well, and they can change. They can I change. Mean, People change their minds. You know, I have this quote in my office from Muhammad Ali that says, um, 
you know, if a man at 40 still thinks the same way as when he was 20, then he's lost 20 years of his life, you know? <laughs> um, and, and thank God we can change. I mean, when I think about how I used to think, you know, and how I think now, um, well, that's what life's all about. Right. So, okay. So let's back up to some of those yes. ideas because, so you were, you were a lefty and then you started teaching in inner city schools. That's right. That's when you started waking up and that's what sort of forced you to, or forced you or led you to write the blog. Yeah. What were some of the ideas that you were seeing specifically that you realized, wow, yeah. this is not working in these schools? Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the big things that I used to think before going into teaching and everyone used to just accept was that, uh, black kids failed at school because white teachers are racist. The system is racist, the white teachers are racist, and that's why black kids are failing. A lot of teachers to, go into teaching for racist purposes, don't you think? Well, this is what's so crazy. <laughs> I was thinking, but I've met hundreds, thousands of teachers. Not one of them has ever said to me, I'm a racist and I want to stop black kids from, from succeeding. Yeah. In fact, they are killing themselves, you know, working all hours, giving everything that they can to the job. Um, and I started to question the kinds of things that the, 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 normal, the normal way of seeing things was uh, what I was being told. Um, and it wasn't just that, you know, in which we might get into later about teaching methods and about um, uh, discipline and so on, the kinds of we're things that worked whole, and didn't work. The whole second half is going to be yes. on your solutions. Right. Now we're just okay, dealing okay. with the, the right, initial right, problems. Right, right, right. Okay. So, yeah, I started to question all of that. And um, I went, there was this uh, black achievement uh, uh, kind of conference that used to happen once a year, which was about improving black achievement and how, what do we do, raising black achievement. And uh, there was a, a labor, uh, so that's our left uh, political party, um, black uh, woman MP, so one of our politicians who used to run this thing. Mm -hmm. And I went along and I took uh, one of the white teachers who I worked with, and he was older than me, he's retired now, and he'd been doing this for 25 years, and I'd given everything to the job, and I took him along, and these people were standing up on stage, essentially saying that white teachers were racist, and I was so embarrassed. I was so humiliated that I had taken this man, giving up his Saturday to go and sit and be told that he's a racist, when he had given everything to these black boys. So we worked in this boys school, and it was mainly black boys in this school. And, um, and I, I was just, I was mortified. Um, so gradually I started to change my mind on these sorts of things. And then I started to see that there was, it had to do with our expectations of kids. It had to do with our, um, our expectations of parents. It had to do with the kinds of values that we, we were giving them. So if we were saying to them, poor you, you're a victim, life is so difficult, you're black, you'll never be able to get anywhere, then it's quite hard for the black inner city boy to go, oh, well, you know, actually it's about working hard. It's about, we always say at school, even when it's difficult, um, especially when it's difficult, you do what's right, right? And as opposed to saying, it's difficult, I can't do it, right? Except before Michaela, that, that business of even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult, that, that value, that, 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 that business of believing in hard work, I, I didn't see it so much. Um, and, and we would give kids excuses. Mm -hmm. We would give kids excuses to fail. And um, I wouldn't do it in my classroom. And uh, the kids behaved for me and the kids learned with me. And of course, I'm not the only teacher who was doing that. There are yeah. teachers all over the place in their own classrooms who are doing that. Uh, what I, what, what, I did wanted the, what did the administration think of you? Because it sounds like, you know, whoa, we've got you, and obviously, as you said, you weren't the only one, but we've got people pushing against the very, because that's the fabric of what these schools eventually become, that it's not, it's not on them, it's on the system that has ruined these people's well, lives poor kids. before they've even begun, yeah. Yeah, they're poor. I mean, I don't suppose people realized what I was saying, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm, you're talking to kids privately, you do your own thing, and if kids are behaving for you and you're getting good results, and then, then the principal loves you, you know? Uh, it just works and people don't know why. Um, and I'm not even sure I realized why. You know, you just, you, you build up an experience over years and you know what works with the kids and how you get them on board and how you show them that you're in charge and, and then you teach them properly and they love you for it. Um, did and you realize that your political evolution was happening at the exact same time? Because it was sort of very personal in the classroom, but then that you were evolving yeah. sort of in, in another sense. Because uh, I think I that's how it is for a lot of people. I, mm. When people come up to me on the street or email me, they're saying, you know, something's happening at work, I'm dealing with this, and now it's starting to make me think differently about politics. Or I used to always 
vote Democrat, but you know, something happened here in my family, we got into a conversation and now I'm starting to think something else is a little bit different. Well, that was the blog. Yeah. So it was the conservatives on my blog that I was realizing I'm agreeing with you and yeah. I'm not agreeing with the left wingers on the blog. Uh, and it was then that I just thought, well, maybe I am just a conservative. <laughs> So, you know, I, um, I accepted it and then in, you know, I accepted the idea of being conservative and then in 2010 I voted conservative, which was a major deal for me. Um, and it was funny because, you know, after I did that, I remember um, this was after I ended up in the press and so on. I was speaking to a friend of mine and I said to her, and she's Indian, and I said to her, you know, yeah, well, obviously you've seen me in the press and everything and how I voted conservative. And she said, well, you know, I have something to tell you, Catherine. I voted conservative too. <laughs> and that's the thing, people are doing this and they can't admit to it. It's so crazy. So I voted conservative in May 2010 and then in October 2010 I was invited to go to the Conservative Party conference to, to give a, a speech. Yes. And that's like a convention. You guys have conventions here. And um, I was a teacher. I never really took much notice of political things. I mean, I, I, didn't, I, I was a bit naive and a bit stupid, to be honest. And um, anyway, I, I went along and I gave this speech, which uh, the audience really liked. And, um, and then I ended up all over the press. Yeah, so this is the speech, really, that changed everything. That changed my life, yeah. Uh, for the worse at the time. I mean, I think now I can look back and say it was for, for the better in many ways. Or, you know, at least, yeah, I mean, I... I, I Every cloud has a silver lining, mm -hmm. and my silver lining has been, has been a good one uh, because I've made it into a silver lining, but I could have been uh, destroyed by it quite yeah. easily. I mean, in the end, I ended up without a job. I was told uh, that I would never get a job in state education ever again. Yeah. Because, Wait, can you just lay out some of the things yeah. that you talked about in the speech? Right, so yeah. I talked about black kids failing and that I talked about, um, I talked about us not expecting enough of kids and how we are constantly making excuses for them and how we label them with things like anger management or uh, you know uh, dyslexia or, or all these kind of labels that we give the kids oh he can't possibly behave he's he's got issues that's what we always say they have we, they have particular needs mm -hmm. and uh, we have to meet their needs um, as opposed to just expecting them to behave um, they, everybody has different needs nobody we can't expect anything of them and that's just the norm it's the norm so I I talked about all of this. I talked about competition and how it was needed in schools that kids need to feel as if they're competing against somebody else and so on. They need to feel like they're being inspired to work hard as opposed to being indulged um, and constantly let off the hook because, well, it's not your fault. Your parents are divorced. It's not your fault because you live on an estate and you're black and your mom is a single mom and you can't possibly do your homework. I mean, I don't understand <laughs> this, you know? Like, and, and that was because over the years, you know, I'd visited, I'd worked for a summer once in South Africa. I'd been to see schools in China and Brazil and India and all of these countries where the kids were far poorer. And yet they were walking five miles, getting to school, and working really hard. So why was it that those kids could do it, and apparently our kids couldn't do it, you know? So that was why I questioned it. And I said all of this stuff at the conference, and the conservatives liked what I said. Yeah. Because nobody ever says this sort of thing. And then, as I say, I was out of a job, and then I thought, what do how, I do? How, wait, how does that happen? So you give this speech, you're fired the next day? I mean, well, no, I resigned in yeah. the end, but it was just untenable. You, like, yeah. the, the press, I was... I was everywhere. It was like one of those Hollywood films. I couldn't go outside my door because there were press waiting outside to talk to me. Yeah. Like, she I says just personal responsibility is a thing, go get her. This is what's so crazy. Yeah. All I'd said was, <laughs> ultimately I was saying that the education system was broken and people wouldn't have that. And the thing is, I do feel it's like the emperor's new clothes, which is that um, everybody knows that there's a problem with the education system, but nobody's willing to say it. Uh, and I, I got hundreds, if not thousands, of emails from teachers all over the country saying, thank God someone said something. Thank you for saying something. I won't tell you my name. Yeah. I can't tell you my name because I'll lose my job because uh, they're all terrified, right? So, so yeah, so I, um, I then thought about the private sector for a bit, but then I thought, I love working with disadvantaged kids. I love working in the inner city. 
This is what I do. This is what I know. I'm not, I'm not giving up. So we had just, you've had charter schools uh, in America for a long time. We, it was only in 2010 that, that free schools, which are charter schools, mm -hmm. started in, you know, there was the possibility of setting one up. So I decided to set up my own school. And I got a group of people together, and then we started trying to set it up. Now, this was not easy because I had a lot of people who hated me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I still have a lot of people who hate me, <laughs> except I do think the number is probably reduced, um, or at least they've just left me alone, actually. I don't know if the number's reduced. I think they just leave me alone. I think at some point they see that you keep going, and That's that it. you keep becoming successful, and then they'll always find someone new to feed on and to scare, <laughs> but it's like, they, you know what I mean? Like yeah. At some point they're like, wow, yeah. we, we haven't got her yet, and, That's it. and then they run out, they're not into hard work, really, so they kind of yeah. are like, all right, Possibly. let's move on to an easier target. Yeah. And it is, I am a more, I'm, it's harder now because, um, because I have the school and it's really hard, although they do try, you know, when we were trying to set up the school, I was used to say, gosh, it's like we're like making nuclear bombs. <laughs> I mean, all we're doing is setting up a school. I mean, we would, we would, um, we would have parents' evenings. So first of all, I'd be out in the street handing out flyers, uh, running into hairdressers and saying, does anybody have any children who might want to go to the secondary school? And you know, women would be coming out of their hairdryers saying, okay, I'll have one, I'll yeah. have one, going into churches and mosques and temples and all sorts. And then we would have a parents' evening. Once we had it in the pub and all these parents were arriving, our detractors are outside picketing. They've got like posters that saying Tory teacher, um, all sorts of insults, the screaming obscenities at me, calling me names. And we had to hire a bouncer because we were so worried about the possible violence. Um, and then when I was talking to the parent, these are parents finding out about a school, yeah. that's it. And they're all poor parents from the inner city, right? So you got all these black mums, black single mums sitting there trying to find out about this new school and all these white middle class people. And when we say middle class, we mean people with money. You guys use it as a working you uh, our when we say middle class you you guys say middle class we mean working class when i say middle class i mean well off people okay. so these white you know well educated well off people are have infiltrated and are sitting amongst all of these inner city people uh, who are wanting to find out about the school. And when I'm talking, they're standing up and shouting abuse deliberately because they're trying to disrupt. Kind of like when you do stuff and like the shaking pennies and jars yeah, and Yeah, yeah, we're, we're gonna talk about that because I know you had a little criticism of the way I dealt with one, one of the issues there oh, right. related to education. We'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, so but, but let's just focus on that for a second. What do you think it is about the intentions of those people? I try not to judge people's intentions. I try to judge their actions. But these these working class, and, and I know you're not into identity politics, but they happen to be white, which you're illustrating here, that they're the ones that are attacking the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. black mothers that are trying to take care of their kids. What is it that these people, what do you think they really think? Why do you think they really are so invested in keeping everything the way it was? They'll demand, they'll say that they're for helping these people all the time. Then they'll look at a system yeah. that does not help these people. Then yeah. someone comes in and says, I'm going to help these people. Yeah. Here's a track record of doing it. Yeah. And they hate you and them. For yeah. It. Yeah, they do. Um, and so just so I'm clear, these are white, well-off people, yeah. right? These are people who, are, who have everything. Yeah. Some of them have been privately educated, right? I think it's because they believe in making people equal, that the state should make people equal, as opposed to giving people equality of opportunity. Because I'm all about giving people equality of opportunity. I want to make it so that schools are so good that everybody has an equal chance of making something of themselves and changing their stars, right? That's what I want to do. Yeah. They don't like that. They want these people to continue being not not being successful and then they as kind of these these white knights in shining armor can come down and and the state can provide you with money and and a, and a free apartment and and all sorts of things and then they can sit at dinner parties and feel very good about themselves mm. because well you know I vote on the left and I'm a very good person um, even though none of it works well, this is it. So they're not interested in whether right. or not it works. Right. They're interested in feeling good about themselves, and they're, they genuinely believe that the state is going to make things better for these people. And free schools, charter schools, while they are state schools, um, they break up the education system, right? So the unions aren't as powerful anymore, and they very much believe in the power of the unions, um, and they want them to have their collective bargaining. And if too many schools break out of the system and break up the system, then it, it devalues that power of the unions. Um, so I think that they convince themselves that what they're doing is right, even though there are all these poor mums 
wanting to find out about another option for their child, and they're desperate. Yeah. I mean, when I say desperate, I've had mothers crying, to, you know, in front of me, crying, saying, I don't want my child to get knifed. I don't want, I want my child to have a decent education so that maybe he'll have a chance to get to university. I just want him to be safe, right? And, and then people are, and then what they'll do is they'll deny that, that, that that's the case, that there are schools where children aren't safe. Mm -hmm. They'll deny. They just, they just lie. They're just bold-faced lies about, about the system. So what other kind of pushback did you get as you were creating the school? Like, what, what is it like to, okay, you, you fill out some paperwork, I assume, and now you, try yeah. to, you talk to some people and maybe you talk to some teachers and like-minded uh, yeah. people well, and some it. administrators and things, but what's that like to go, I'm, I gotta find a building, I gotta find funding, the whole that's thing? That's right, so it's a total nightmare. <laughs> it's a total nightmare. And I mean, really, whenever any group comes to me and says, oh, we wanna set up a school, I always say, okay, well, dig deep, right? Because you're gonna have to get every bit of energy you've got to be able to push through on this. I mean, it took us three years. Um, and it took us three years to find a building. There were so many people against us. Um, and as you were saying earlier, I just kept going. And I mean, I kind of had to keep going because otherwise I wasn't gonna be able to do the job that I love. So I had to. And eventually we found this building. I mean, so first you apply, you have to go for interviews, you know, the panel interviews and blah, blah, and then you get approved and then you're looking for a building and, oh, it's just all a nightmare. But um, eventually we got this building, uh, which, you know, isn't the greatest building. And when I say it's not great, you know, there's no grass, there are no trees, there's no car park for the staff, there's just the old car park, which is used as a playground for the kids, which is tiny. You know, mm -hmm. it isn't ideal. But I always say it's the people inside the building that matter. And we've made a real go of it. And, um, and it, you know, it's, it's great. It's, 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 and, and what is great? And, and what it really is great? And this is where, you know, I, I'm really, you know, I feel really optimistic, is that we have five to ten teachers from all over the world that come and visit the school every single day. Mainly from the UK, but we get Americans, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders. I mean, and they come because they've heard about us through social media, and they want to see what we do. And then we get loads of letters from teachers, from principals who say, I've taken these ideas and I've put them in my school, and it's really helped. And, it, and it's made things better for our kids. So I feel like we're not just having impact in our school, on our kids, but on, on kids all over the world, you know?